Last week we right. left off um, with the second intifada that broke out in the year 2000. Now, Arafat died in November of 2004. And to replace him, Mahmoud Abbas was elected president of the Palestinian National Authority. And like Arafat, Abbas ran up against Islamic extremists when he tried to set up further peace negotiations with Israel. Abbas's presidency became even more difficult in 2006 when Hamas, which had been uh, established during the first intifada, Hamas became the dominant force in Gaza by January of 2006. So we had a situation where Abbas was the head of the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, and Abbas was the ruling force in Gaza. So now we're going to take a look at the policies of George W. Bush uh, in regard to the Israeli-Palestinian dispute. Now, like his predecessors in the White House, George W. Bush, Bush continued to pursue the possibilities of a peace between Israelis and Palestinians. Because of the wave of political violence on the part of Palestinians and incidents of terrorism during the second intifada, in June of 2002, Israel began to construct a separation barrier in the West Bank, parts of which were built on land, was built on land seized from Palestinians. So you see here on this map, the uh, barrier is in this red and parts of it uh, go into the West Bank. When it was completed four years later, the wall ran a length of 440 miles. Now Israel claimed that the barrier was necessary for its security. And the wall did significantly reduce bombings originating from the West Bank. But human rights groups and members of the international community alleged that the wall served to undermine peace negotiations because it unilaterally established new de facto borders since part of the wall uh, included uh, territories or well, separated some territories of the West Bank from the rest of the West Bank. Palestinians claim that the wall severely restricted their ability to travel and impaired their ability to commute to work within the West Bank or in Israel. The UN General Assembly adopted a resolution finding the barrier to be a violation of international law and it demanded its removal. But nevertheless, President Bush pressed forward with his plan for peace. In June, I'm sorry, in July of 2002, the quartet outlined a roadmap for peace. The quartet was made up of the UN, the United States, Russia, and the European Union. And <clears throat> these four entities outlined the principles for a roadmap for peace, which included the establishment of an independent Palestinian state. That roadmap was released in April of 2003. It called for the Palestinian Authority to end all terrorist attacks and for Israel to freeze all settlement activity. That is, that Israel would be required um, to refrain from building settlements in the West Bank. But unfortunately, this roadmap proved unworkable. So here is a cartoon showing Secretary of State Colin Powell consulting the roadmap. And as you can see, ain't going nowhere, you can't get there, don't count on it, etc. The fact is that Abbas's Palestinian Authority was not able to stop attacks during the second intifada. And Ariel Sharon's government was unwilling to set a limit on future settlements 
in the occupied territories. And so the roadmap essentially was dead in the water. And obstacles to peace grew even more formidable in 2006 when Hamas took control of the Gaza Strip. Because as I mentioned, that splinted the <clears throat> Palestinians into two um, political groups, the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, Hamas in Gaza. And each claimed to be the true representative of the Palestinian people. Now, Israel refused to negotiate with Hamas since Hamas insisted that Israel had no right to exist. Hamas claimed that the entire state of Israel represented an illegal occupation, which must be wiped out. And Hamas repeatedly launched rocket and mortar attacks on nearby Israeli towns and cities. And that prompted massive Israeli bombardment of the Gaza Strip in 2009, again in 2012 and 2014, and as well as this year. Um, some cynics call Israel's bombing of uh, Gaza mowing the lawn. That is, Israel must periodically bomb Gaza uh, the way you must periodically mow the lawn. And the reason is, according to the mowing the lawn theory is that Hamas is always trying to build up rockets and build tunnels. And so periodically, Israel must eliminate those rockets and tunnels. Now, since Hamas won the election in Gaza in 2006, Israel imposed economic sanctions on Gaza, including a blockade of materials that would be allowed to enter from Israel into Gaza as well as restrictions on movements of people. As a result of the imposed land, sea, and air blockade, along with the closure of the Rafah uh, entry into Gaza, as we can see here, the Rafah crossing connects Egypt with Gaza, and um, the Erez crossing connects Israel with Gaza, and so these crossings were closed off and the blockade essentially uh, locked in nearly 2 million Palestinians. Critics charge that Israel and Egypt have turned Gaza into an open air prison where the nearly 2 million people living in Gaza um, cannot leave. Israel says that the blockade is necessary in order to protect Israeli citizens from terrorism, rocket attacks, and other hostile activity emanating from Gaza. And Israel defends the blockade because it prevents the entry of weapons and war material into Gaza. Now, the definition of war material uh, is somewhat vague. So for example, uh, Israel does not allow uh, cement to be um, uh, entered into Gaza because Israel claims that that cement is not being used to build houses for people in Gaza, but rather to build tunnels for the militants uh, in Gaza. Now, the blockade has been criticized by the UN Human Rights Council and other human rights organizations. The International Committee of the Red Cross termed the blockade collective punishment. That is that it punishes all the people in Gaza and that any blockade is in violation of international law. In July of 2006, Hezbollah in Lebanon launched an operation against Israel in an attempt to pressure Israel into releasing Lebanese prisoners. And the Hezbollah attack killed a number of Israeli soldiers and also captured two Israeli soldiers. In response, Israel launched an offensive into southern Lebanon in order to recover the captured soldiers. 
This conflict lasted 34 days and left more than 1,000 Lebanese dead and about 1 million others displaced. Several Arab leaders criticized Hezbollah for inciting the conflict. But nevertheless, Hezbollah's ability to fight the Israeli defense forces to a standstill won it praise throughout much of the Arab world. By 2009, President Obama came to office. And when he became president, he pledged to remodel the US relationship with the countries of the Middle East and to improve America's image in the Muslim world. But he had to deal with two ongoing wars, one in Iraq and the other in Afghanistan. He also had to deal with simmering terrorist threats throughout the Middle East, as well as with the moribund Israeli-Palestinian peace process. Nevertheless, President Obama made achieving a peace deal between Israel and the Palestinians a major goal of his administration. Now, US-Israeli relations came under serious strain in March of 2010, when then Vice President Joe Biden was visiting Jerusalem at the very time that Biden was in Jerusalem, Israel announced it was pushing ahead with the construction of 1,600 new homes in East Jerusalem. In September 2010, Obama pushed to revive the stalled peace process by getting the parties involved to agree to direct talks. And so for the first time in two years, both sides agreed to enter negotiations. Obama hoped to forge the framework for a final agreement within one year. The talks aimed to put the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to an official end by creating a two-state solution, that is, a Jewish state and a Palestinian state, and by getting all sides to renounce the use of force. But once again, Islamic extremists sabotaged peace talks. Hamas and Hezbollah threatened violence to undermine any compromise between Israeli and Palestinian negotiators. And so as a result, the Israeli government publicly stated that peace could not exist even if both sides signed the agreement. But because of the stance taken by Hamas and Hezbollah, peace was impossible. Then in November 2012, Israel killed the military chief of Hamas, Ahmed Jabari. And that touched off more than a week of rocket fire from Gaza into Israel and retaliatory Israeli airstrikes into Gaza. Some 150 Palestinians and six Israelis were killed in the 2012 fighting. As Obama pressed forward with his initiatives for a Middle East peace, Benjamin Netanyahu in turn released his plans to build thousands of homes in the West Bank, which infuriated President Obama. And as a result, Obama allowed a UN security resolution condemning Israeli settlement constructions to be adopted. That is, he directed the U US amb ambassador to the UN to vote to abstain on a Security Council resolution to condemn the construction of Israeli settlements. And so for the first time, the United States abstained rather than supported Israel. That abstention really represented the final bitter chapter in the years of antagonism between President Barack Obama's administration and the government of Netanyahu. Now, the specific sources of friction between Obama and Netanyahu included the following. Obama endorsed Israel's 1967 borders as the basis for a two-state solution with the Palestinians. Now, this is the extent of Israel's borders in 1967. 
And at its narrowest point, Israel extended just nine miles. And Netanyahu rejected any return to 1967 borders, claiming that those borders endangered Israel's security. And so that was one area of disagreement between the American president and the Israeli prime minister. The second issue was over settlements. Netanyahu supported the construction of additional settlements in the West Bank. Obama opposed that. And Netanyahu was very disappointed over the United States' decision to ease sanctions on Iran and for Obama's decision to enter into the nuclear deal with Iran. Now, U.S.-Israeli relations were particularly stressed in May of 2015 when Netanyahu accepted an invitation from Republicans to speak to Congress. And he accepted the, the invitation and came to Congress without notifying the Obama White House. And speaking before Congress, Netanyahu used the occasion to excoriate the Obama administration for engaging in talks to limit Iran's nuclear capabilities. The Israeli prime minister implored Congress to vote to impose new sanctions on Iran, which if Congress would have done so, that would have killed the nuclear talks between the United States and Iran. And it would have significantly altered US policy towards the Middle East. Obama and other Democrats accused Netanyahu and Republicans for working to undermine not just Obama's efforts to strike a nuclear deal with Iran, but to undermine his presidential authority over foreign policy. So here we see this cartoon. Netanyahu says, I deeply regret that some perceive my being here as political. Well, clearly, it was political because it was the Republicans who invited Netanyahu, and Netanyahu used the occasion to criticize the Obama administration. But I want to say that while much has been written about the frosty relationship between Obama and Netanyahu, it should be noted that President Bush also called Israeli settlement expansion an impediment to any peace talks. And Bush urged the dismantling of unauthorized settler outposts. And despite Republican accusations that Obama was anti-Israel, we should keep in mind that Netanyahu and Obama stood shoulder to shoulder in opposing Palestinian attempts to apply for statehood at the UN. And under Obama, US economic and military support for Israel remained as robust as it was under Bush. The United States, for the first time under Obama, supplied Israel with bunker busting bombs. Also, the United States joined in with Israel to wage cyber warfare against Iranian nuclear facilities. And under Obama, the United States did impose sanctions against Iran. In fact, under the Obama administration, the United States financial aid to Israel increased to $3 billion for the first time in history. But Obama attempted to apply tough love to Israel. And he wanted to make a, an ally see that undertaking compromises was necessary for any peace with Palestinians. Now, he tried to make the point that peace was the only way to preserve the Zionist dream of a democratic and Jewish state. Under Obama, there were several efforts to restart the stalled peace negotiations, but all to no avail. 
In the summer of 2014, Hamas militants killed three Israeli teenagers that were kidnapped near a Jewish settlement in the West Bank. And once again, that prompted an Israeli military response. Hamas answered with rocket attacks coming from Gaza, and that resulted in a seven-week conflict that left more than 2,200 Palestinians in Gaza dead. 67 Israeli soldiers were killed, along with six Israeli civilians. The most recent conflict between Israel and Hamas occurred just this past May. And that conflict really illustrates how differently the two sides perceive these issues. The Israelis claim that Hamas started the fighting by launching missiles into Israeli towns and cities. And that sowed fear throughout Israel and killed at least 12 Israeli residents, including among them two children. And so Israeli airstrikes and artillery then attacked Gaza, killing 230, including 65 children. Israeli strategists described the campaign's aim to be the destruction of Hamas's infrastructure, including the rocket factories and underground tunnels that Hamas had built. But once again, Israel came under increasing international criticism for the number of children who were killed in airstrikes on Gaza. Israel, in turn, claimed that the civilian casualties was the result of Hamas's policy of placing its rockets amid highly populated areas so that if Israel tried to destroy those rocket depots, there would have to be high civilian ca casualties, which Hamas would then use for propaganda purposes to condemn Israel. So that's the way it looked from the Israeli side. But to Palestinians, the root cause of the violence began before Hamas launched missiles. It began over an intense dispute in East Jerusalem, which is predominantly Palestinian. On May 10th, several Palestinian families were evicted from their homes in East Jerusalem in order to make way for Israeli settlement construction. And that sparked widespread Palestinian protests. Israeli police responded by raiding the al Aska Mosque compound, one of Islam's holiest sites. The Israeli police wanted to keep Palestinian protesters from throwing stones, they said. But the raid at the mosque left hundreds of Palestinians wounded from rubber bullets and stun gun grenades. So it was at this point that militants in Gaza began firing rockets into Israel. And then Israel responded with airstrikes. So from the Palestinian perspective, the violence was provoked by Israel's mistreatment of Palestinians in East Jerusalem and in the West Bank. Well, after 11 days of intense fighting, a ceasefire was finally arranged and that ceasefire seems to be holding. Now let us turn to the Middle East policy under President Donald Trump. When Trump took office in 2017, he said he was willing to explore all avenues to strike what he described as the ultimate deal for peace in the Middle East. Now, for decades, American presidents had insisted that the only way to bring lasting peace to the Middle East was through a two-state solution. That is, a Jewish state alongside a Palestinian state. But in February of 2017, Trump declared that he could live with either a two-state or a one-state solution. Now, Netanyahu had endorsed the idea of a two-state solution in, 20, in 2009 under pressure from the Obama administration. But Netanyahu sidestepped questions at a joint press conference with Trump 
about whether he still supported a two-state solution. Now, early in Trump's presidency, Israel announced thousands of new settlement homes in the West Bank. Then in March of 2017, Israel approved construction of the first new West Bank settlements in more than 20 years. Trump told the line on settlements at this time in March of 2017. He stuck to the previous um, policies of, of previous presidents, calling on Netanyahu to hold back on settlements for a little bit. And later, he said that these new construction plans in the West Bank were unhelpful for the peace process. So in that sense, Trump was following the same policy as Obama and Bush and previous presidents going back to Jimmy Carter. But after March of 2017, Trump began to cultivate his image as the most pro-Israel president in American history. He was the first sitting US president to pray at the Western Wall. In December of 2017, he announced his decision to recognize Jerusalem as the official capital of Israel. Now, why was this important and why was it controversial? Well, up until December of 2017, the United States refused to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Instead, it recognized Tel Aviv as the capital and the US embassy was located in Tel Aviv. So why didn't American presidents recognize Jerusalem as its capital since Israel recognizes Jerusalem as its capital? Well, Palestinians claimed East Jerusalem and that if there was ever going to be a Palestinian state, its capital would be East Jerusalem. East Jerusalem was taken during the 1967 war. And so to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel would mean that East Jerusalem would never be the capital of any future Palestinian state. And so until Trump, American presidents were reluctant to recognize Jerusalem as the capital because that would quash the possibility of East Jerusalem ever belonging to a Palestinian state, and that would be a major impediment to any uh, ultimate peace between Israel and Palestinians. Also, by recognizing Jerusalem, that would abandon the pretense that the United States is a neutral uh, mediator uh, between Israelis and Palestinians. But Trump broke precedent in December of 2017 by giving official recognition to Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Then in March of 2019, Trump officially recognized Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights. And in August of 2020, less than a year ago, the United States helped to arrange the Abraham Accords by which the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain agreed to normalize relations with Israel. Up until the Abraham Accords, Israel had normalized relations only with Egypt and Jordan. Now two more Arab states said they would agree to normalize relations with Israel. In a speech in 2019, Trump said, that the Jewish state has never had a better friend in the White House than your president. And Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu agreed, telling Trump in 2020 that he has been the greatest friend that Israel has ever had in the White House. Now, like presidents before him, Trump hoped to be the American president to finally end the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And he gave a central role in the peace process to his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, who, like Trump, was a real estate developer 
with no experience in diplomacy or in international affairs. The peace plan was released in February of 2020, and it proposed giving Israel most of what it had sought over decades of conflict, while it offered the Palestinians the possibility of a state, but a state with limited sovereignty. So let us take a look at the nuts and bolts of the peace plan that Jared Kushner and President Trump put together. It called for total Israeli control over Jerusalem. And it provided that whatever Jewish settlements existed in the West Bank, those settlements would remain. In turn, it offered $80 billion in international investment to build a Palestinian state. And this new Palestinian state would have a capital that would have to be located outside of Jerusalem. So there could be no capital in East Jerusalem. In addition, the Palestinian state would not be permitted to have a standing army. And it would be required to meet other benchmarks overseen by Israel, including a renunciation of violence and the disbanding of militant groups such as Hamas. The plan did not include any right of return of Palestinian refugees. And it would allow Israel to annex up to 30% of the occupied West Bank. So here we see a map on the left of the current map of Israel. And the map on the right shows the proposed uh, peace plan drawn up by Trump and Kushner. And so the state of Israel would remain as it was in this map, except that large parts of territory on the east side of the West Bank, bordering the Jordan River, would then be added to Israel. And so some 30% of the West Bank would become part of Israel, and Jewish settlements would remain. And this Palestinian state envisioned by the Trump peace plan, as you can see, would not be contiguous with other areas that would be part of the new state of Palestine. Now, this proposed deal represented a sharp shift in the American approach because it meant that the United States would no longer support just modest adjustments of the 1967 boundaries. This was a much more radical adjustment. And it meant that the United States would discard the longtime goal of guaranteeing the Palestinians a wholly autonomous state. Now, when Trump announced the plan, he was flanked by Netanyahu, but no counterpart from the Palestinian leadership was present nor was any Palestinian consulted or briefed when these arrangements were drawn up. Nevertheless, <clears throat> Trump characterized it as, quote, the deal of the century, whereas Mahmoud Abbas, president of the Palestinian Authority, rejected the plan as, quote, the slap of the century. The promise of economic aid, the $80 billion in investments, was clearly not enough to get Palestinians to sacrifice their national aspirations. The plan was also widely rejected throughout the Arab world and beyond. And so it was dead on arrival as reflected in this cartoon. Now, while many Israelis and some American Jews might agree that Israel never had a better friend in the White House than Trump, I would strongly disagree with that. Withdrawing the United States from the 2015 Iran nuclear deal has enabled Iran to ramp up its nuclear program. Also, part of the Abraham Accords that Trump arranged between the United Arab 
Emirates and Bahrain included the sale of F-35 fighter jets to the United Arab Emirates. And that allows former adversaries of Israel to have access to sophisticated American military equipment. And that diminishes one of Israel's strategic advantages. And I would argue that Trump's faulty approach to the Israel-Palestinian peace process has degraded Israel's security. Now, while many supporters of Israel might applaud Trump's decision to recognize Israel's sovereignty over Golan and to move the American embassy to Jerusalem, those decisions have forfeited any potential American role to serve as an honest broker to bring the two sides together. And that has left the Israeli-Palestinian conflict um, at least a peace, a peaceful resolution, uh, remote as ever before. In addition, by demonizing Democrats, Trump has damaged the bipartisanship on which the durability of the US-Israeli relationship depends. Trump caustically remarked, talking to Jews, if you vote for a Democrat, you are very, very disloyal to Israel and to the Jewish people. Now, the strength of the US-Israel alliance depends on a political consensus between America's two main political parties. The relationship with Israel can't and should not depend on the desires and ambitions of a single party, the Republican Party, or a single politician. When Netanyahu went before Congress in 2015 and spoke against Obama's Iran deal, the fault line between Israelis and Jewish Americans became publicly visible for the first time. An Associated Press poll showed that 68% of Jewish Americans voted for Biden, whereas just 30% voted for Trump. But 63% of Israelis supported Trump. Only 17% supported Biden, according to a November poll by the Israel Democracy Institute. And so we see a real disjuncture between the way Jewish Americans see things politically and the way Israelis see the um, relationship with America. And the fact is, while many Jews regret this, Israel is no longer the priority that it once was for younger Jewish Americans. Netanyahu's American support relied on an alliance of Orthodox Jews and evangelical Christians. And that has produced some surreal moments, such as at the ceremony that marked the opening of the US Embassy in Jerusalem, a televangelist who once said that th this opening of the US Embassy featured a televangelist who once said that the Holocaust was simply God's way to get the Jewish people to return to Israel. Now, Netanyahu had built a close relationship with Trump and his administration. And Trump's alignment with Netanyahu was so complete that according to the left-leaning Israeli newspaper Haaretz, if Israel were a US state, it would be the reddest state in the union. A large part of the political right in Israel, a large part of their affinity for Trump stemmed from Trump's willingness to accept new settlements in the West Bank while ignoring the Palestinians who live there. But the Trump-Netanyahu bromance ended suddenly after Biden's victory this past November. According to Michael Wolff in his new book, Landslide, The Final Days of the Trump Presidency, Trump considered Netanyahu's congratulations to Biden as the ultimate betrayal, even though Netanyahu was among the last of the world leaders to acknowledge Biden's victory. Netanyahu, in turn, 
dropped Trump from the banner photo of his Twitter account. Now let us turn to President Biden's policy towards Israel. To begin with, all three of Biden's children married Jews. His Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, served as the Deputy National Security Advisor during the Obama administration. And he is said to be responsible for securing the replenishment of Israel's anti-missile system during the 2014 offensive in Gaza. But with the United States today beset with a global pandemic, with issues of racial justice, with controversies over immigration and infrastructure problems, Israel will not be a high priority for the Biden administration, at least not for now. Last month, Biden welcomed the new Israeli government coalition led by the uh, Prime Minister Naftali Bennett and sought, Biden sought to reaffirm ties between the two countries, saying that the United States remained committed to Israel's security and would work with the new government in Israel. However, it's clear that Biden's Israeli policy will be very different from that of Trump's. Whereas Trump preferred to deal with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict unilaterally, Biden is more inclined to cooperate with the quartet, that is with the United States, Russia, European Union, and UN in seeking a resolution to the conflict. In the past, Biden has claimed that the two-state solution is the only way to resolve the conflict. However, Biden's administration has not yet gone into any detail regarding core issues such as Jerusalem, final borders between the two states, the question of refugees and security. But it does seem that Biden is looking to reset the relationship with the Palestinian leadership in the West Bank. In the most recent fighting between Israel and Hamas a few months ago, Biden pressured Netanyahu for a ceasefire. During Blinken's recent visit to Israel, he warned Israeli leaders that evicting Palestinian families from East Jerusalem could undermine even further the difficult prospect of peace, and it would spark renewed tensions, conflict, and war. Biden reportedly rejected support for any future plans by Israel to annex annex the West Bank. And once again, Biden called any future settlement activity in the West Bank an impediment to peace. Okay, so as we conclude these four lectures, I think it would be useful to take a step back to assess the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians. The problem between the two is much greater today than it was when Israel was established in 1948 and 49. The mass immigration of Soviet Jews to Israel and the less liberally inclined Sephardim has made Israel a more divided nation. Israel's expansion into East Jerusalem and the West Bank has made a viable two-state solution even more difficult. With Fatah and Hamas both claiming to represent the Palestinian people, the Palestinian negotiating position is weaker today than it has ever been. And the emergence of radical Islamic forces such as Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Hamas, and Hezbollah, all of which call for the destruction of Israel, represents yet another complication, as is the rise of Iran and its support for anti-Israeli extremists. So to recap the positions on both sides, both sides advance a legal ar argument to support their case. For the Israelis, Zionists base the legal justification for the establishment of Israel on the Balfour Declaration and the 1947 UN partition vote. Palestinians, on the other hand, 
maintained that Britain had no right to issue the Balfour Declaration in the first place, um, because at that time, um, the British um, were um, fighting World War I, and according to the Palestinians, they had no right to uh, designate their territory to another entity. What right did Britain have to give away another people's land, they asked. And Palestinians maintained that the 1947 UN partition plan ignored the Palestinians' right to self-determination, that is to determine their own future. Both sides advance historical arguments. On the Israeli side, the argument is that Israel has been the rightful homeland for Jews dating back to biblical times. And throughout the diaspora, Jews worldwide longed to return to Jerusalem. Palestinians argue that the history of Jewish Israel ended in 137 when the Romans uh, suppressed a Jewish revolt and dispersed the Jews from biblical Israel. And Palestinians maintain there has not been a Jewish majority in Israel until the middle of the 20th century. They also maintain that the cultural identity of the Jewish people does not entitle them to colonize a land inhabited by Palestinians, particularly at a time when the rest of the world was turning against colonialism. So that is the anti-colonialist argument that the Palestinians advance. Both sides advance moral arguments. Jews without a homeland had been subjected to centuries of persecution, culminating in the Holocaust, one of the most horrific chapters in modern history. And under Nazi oppression, Palestine was the only haven for Jewish refugees. And having a national homeland today guarantees that Jews will always have a port of refuge against any future attempts at genocide. Palestinians, on the other hand, argue that they did not perpetrate the Holocaust, yet they are having to pay the price. If there was to be a Jewish homeland because of the Holocaust, they say, why not in Germany rather than in Palestine? Because Germany was responsible for the Holocaust. Now, we're going to look at different issues that must be resolved if there is going to be any lasting peace. The issue of refugees and the right of return. On the Israeli side, the argument is that if five Arab nations had not attacked Israel in 1948, there would not have been hundreds of thousands of Palestinian refugees. That those who fled their homes could have been spared the tragedy had Arab countries accepted the UN partition plan. And given Arab antagonism to the Jewish state, it's understandable why Israel is opposed to the return of the refugees. Israel is a tiny country. It cannot possibly absorb millions of Palestinian refugees. And so the Israeli argument is that neighboring Arab countries should provide a homeland for Palestinian refugees. Palestinians argue, on the other hand, that many of the refugees were forced to leave in 1948, forced by Israeli soldiers, and that Israel provides a right of return to Jews anywhere in the world, even if they have not been victims of persecution. And they argue there should be a right of return for Palestinians, just as there is for Jews. As to having Arab countries setting aside land for a Palestinian state, Arab nations have carried the burden of Palestinian refugees long enough, they say. And Palestinians do not want to seize lands of other countries. They just want to repossess the land and property that they say was taken away from them. 
Now, what are the arguments concerning the ongoing conflict? Well, Israelis claim that Arab nations have repeatedly denied Israel's right to exist. While Jews have sought peace with their neighbors, Arabs have continually waged war against Israel, and that Israel has not been the aggressor in those conflicts. Palestinians argue that there can be no real peace until the military occupation ends and past grievances are redressed. They argue that the relentless building of illegal settlements on Palestinian land makes a mockery of the peace process. Now to argue which side has the more legitimate historical claim is an unproductive debate in my opinion. Israel is a political reality and only if all parties accept that reality can there be a genuine and lasting peace. For Israelis, the crucial question is, what can Israel do to remain a democratic Jewish state? That is the Zionist ideal, a democratic Jewish state. And the only way to do so, in my estimation, is through a two-state solution. If the status quo remains in the foreseeable future, there will be a one-state solution. In other words, the Palestinians living in the West Bank and in Gaza will ultimately be part of a larger Israeli nation. And because the Arab population will eventually outnumber Jews in that single state, and let's look at the statistics. There are a total of 6,390,000 Palestinians in the West Bank, in Israel proper, and in Gaza, compared to 6,738,000 Jews in Israel. But the birth rate of Palestinians is far higher than that of Jews. And so in the near future, if there is a one-state solution, Jews will be in the minority. And if that happens, Israel cannot be a democratic Jewish state. It can be democratic and it can be Jewish, but it cannot be both. If it remains a Jewish state with a majority Arab population, that will be an undemocratic apartheid state. On the other hand, if Israel remains a democracy with a majority Arab population, it will no longer be a Jewish state. If there is to be a two-state solution, Palestinians must agree on a unified leadership. Otherwise, there may have to be a three-state solution, Israel, West Bank, and Gaza. But Gaza and the West Bank as two entities will not be viable states. And the prospects for Hamas and the Palestinian Authority of getting together, that prospect is not promising. And both governments have proven to be inept and corrupt. And if there can be a unified Palestinian government, outstanding issues with Israel must be resolved. And the only way to resolve it is through compromise. Now, while concessions will undoubtedly be hard for each side to swallow, they are absolutely essential. So let's take a look at six outstanding issues, point by point. But before I offer my suggestions for peace, I want to make it clear that none of the following could happen unless Fatah and Hamas can form a unified government. So the first outstanding issue has to do with borders and settlements. Israel claims that some settlements in the West Bank are absolutely essential to its security. Now, I would suggest that those settlements can be incorporated into Israel proper, but Israel would have to exchange other territory to be part of a new Palestinian state. In other words, that Israel would retain those settlements it claims that is absolutely essential to its security. 
but it would have to um, reciprocate by giving territory to a new Palestinian state. As far as the status of Jerusalem, West Jerusalem can remain the capital of Israel and East Jerusalem can also serve as the capital of a Palestinian nation. Now that's not the most convenient solution, but given the importance of Jerusalem to both sides, it is a practical solution. Now, concerning the right of refugees to return, this is the thorniest issue, and it will take some creativity to resolve. For reasons of demography and security, Israel cannot possibly accept the return of 4 million Palestinians. But it can offer financial compensation for the descendants of those who lost lands and property in 1948. But I would suggest as long as Arab nations offer similar compensation to Jews they expelled after 1948. So once again, a quid pro quo. Israel offering compensation to the descendants of Palestinian refugees. Arab countries like Morocco and Iraq offer compensation to Jews that they expelled after Israel became a nation. Now, once these major issues are resolved, the question of water distribution and future security, these questions can be worked out. One possibility would be to station a UN-sponsored international peacekeeping force on the borders between Israel and a new Palestinian state. Now, I'm not suggesting any of this will be easy, but I do believe it's necessary. And as I said, many of these compromises will be painful, especially for extremists on both sides. But let's think about the alternative to peace, a continuation of the cycle of violence and reprisals with the possibility of a wider war between Israel and Iran or between Israel and other Arab states. That is not something that I think Israelis want to contemplate. And for Israel, no peace invariably would lead to a one state solution. And that would mean the end of a Jewish democratic Israel. Now, peace certainly is not on the horizon. Aside from the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians, any resolution must deal with interference from Iran and other outside forces such as Hezbollah but the longer the conflict persists, Palestinians will lose support from many Arab states. And those Arab states are now more worried about Iran than they are about Israel. So I think there are compelling reasons on both sides to return to the negotiation table. One thing is certain, there will be no peace as long as each side regards compromise as a sign of weakness. And that concludes my take on the two promised land. So Jerry, now if you will recognize people